everybody. Hey, oh, good afternoon. Yeah. I was going to say good afternoon or good yeah. evening, depending on where you are. Yeah, to where you are. I know we had some people in the UK who were going to try to join us this evening, their evening, daytime here. Lisa Wagoner here. And Brad Wagoner. Cold Nose College. We just uh, had so much fun last time we did one of these live things. We thought we'd do another one and talk today a little bit about resource guarding, what it is and how to deal with it. Yeah. And hey, Elizabeth, thanks for joining us. Nice to have you here. So when we talked, uh, did a post about resource guarding that we were going to be doing this, we had someone ask, what is resource guarding? Because we're dog trainers, we tend to talk in dog trainer terms sometimes. And the layman term for resource guarding is the unwillingness to share. So our own dogs, Kaylee and Cody, have periodically been unwilling to share some of their resources. And uh, we're going to talk about them a little bit. We're going to talk about gosh, what it is, that it's natural, normal, what those ritualized behaviors are, things that dogs guard, how it can be modified, the prognosis of modification, and really important, you know, prevention. And Lisa mentioned, it's normal. We are resource guarders. We probably lock our homes when we leave for the day. If, if I were walking down the street and someone tried to take the wallet out of my back pocket, I, I'm going to growl. Might even bite. Yeah. Um, we lock our cars. Yep. Yep. But in our homes, we, you know, it's not that we're the boss and we have to be able to take things away from our not dog. It's just that we want the dog to feel comfortable if we move close to them, if they have a, a valued object or if another dog comes by. So I think about um, the comfort of dogs in my home, their physical and the emotional comfort, just like I would a person in my home. Uh, we don't have children, um, but if we did, I'd certainly want them to feel emotionally comfortable and happy in my home and want them to be able to share things with me. I want my dog to have that ability um, and emotional comfort to do that as well. So and, let's, talk, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the dogs in our life. Ah, well, there was Abby, our first dog, who... Long before we were dog trainers. Before we knew what we were looking at. So uh, she actually shared pretty well with people. Um, but with other dogs, not so much. So with when Gibson, um, an Australian Shepherd puppy, came into our home, as he got older, she would um, very um, um, appropriately. appropriately walk to him, grab whatever chewy toy he had, and move away with it. And Gibson was like, hey, you know, I don't really mind so much. He never cared that she took something away from him. We didn't know what we were looking at the time. At, at the time, but Abby um, was wanted his prized possession, and he didn't care about that, so he did not guard that item. You know, some dogs will simply just pick up the item and move away with it. They won't say anything, and they won't give you the look, if you will. Um, I know that picture we posted uh, when we were talking about uh, this uh, live session we're having today. Uh, was a picture of Cody uh, when Willow, or excuse me, when Kaylee was a puppy. I was sitting on the couch with Cody, and Kaylee decided she wanted to jump up there too. And that picture just happened, you know, right there in front of my face, which was pretty scary. Um, <laughs> and it was his way of saying, "Hey, back down. This person is mine right now, and I'm not going to share." So that was a pretty clear signal he gave that. He was not going to share me at that time. And Haley, for the most part, respected that. Um, she's still learning. She's still just seven months seven old. Months. Yeah. Um, right into you know, adolescence. Again, back to our previous dogs, Cody and Willow, uh, they shared beautifully. They never had a moment of tension that we ever saw between them over a guarded resource. Gosh, we're seeing so many friends join us. So, got Shane. Hey, Kay. McKenzie. Hey, Jerry. Uh -oh, uh, Stacy. Mom's here. Uh, so. Yeah, Jerry Wagoner, our awesome mom. Um, Helga, all the way up in Norway. Oh, and this Brittany. Is a, hey, Brittany. A reunion of uh, Victoria, Victoria Silva Academy students. I love it. Glad Thank to you, see guys. Back. Yeah. yeah. Um, so feel free to pop a question in here yeah. too as we're going, or you know, we'll try to answer that as well. We may be going to cover it here, but. Shout out if you do have a question. So, um, Brad, in that moment, so talk about what you did in that moment when 
um, Cody showed that lovely snarl like, hey, I don't want to share my space with Kaylee. What was it that you did? I was actually in the UK, guys, teaching um, at the time. Well, I thought I was going to wet my pants because that look <laughs> was right there in my face. Um, I just redirected uh, Kaylee. I uh, tossed a toy away so that she would move away. And then I got up and moved away as well so that that tension simply wouldn't be there. Um, it was a form of management. Uh, I you know, would rather that had not happened, but it was easier at that time just to prevent the unwanted behavior uh, from going any further, from escalating. And that photo that's on our website that was next to Cody's snarling face was taken just moments later. Oh, so within 30 seconds, Kaylee just went and got up on the far side of the couch, and he was fine with that. He just didn't want her up in my lap while he had my lap. So, so dogs can um, guard things, um, to toys, bones, etc. They can also guard locations. They can guard spaces, um, and they can guard other people. Yeah, they can their bed, uh, anything they find of value. They can uh, guard it, protect it from um, a perceived threat or thinking it's going to be taken away. Uh, often we'll hear someone say, oh, my dog's very protective of me. And they're saying it almost in a proud sense, thinking that their dog is protecting them from bodily harm. Mm, and I would say they're more in the line of protecting you from being taken away. You know, they may not care if the person kills you, as long <laughs> as they don't remove the body. You no, know, oh, this is my person, you can't have it, um, type of thing. So, so, so dogs guard things. Dogs. Uh, um, like to hold on to things and protect them against other dogs and also from other people. So in, we've been fortunate within our home with all the dogs we've had in our lives, we've, we have not had a dog who's presented with the behavior of um, growling, freezing, snapping, snarling, biting, if we need to take something away from the dog. And there are ways to modify that um, behavior if your dog is doing that. Yeah, we'll get into that for just a little bit. What we are experiencing now, some uh, with Cody and Kaylee, especially uh, a couple months ago when Kaylee was still a good bit younger, uh, he wasn't real thrilled with her. I think we've talked about that in the past. And so anything, anytime she came near, he you know gave that big lip curl, and she started slowly to understand what that meant um, just last night they each had a bully stick and she wanted both bully sticks imagine that my adolescent girl <laughs> so so you know this is where some management comes into play we just watched carefully we were aware of what was going on and you know it got to the point where we were having to jump up off the couch to manage a bit much so we just took the bully sticks up and saved them for another time when they could be more relaxed with them so let's talk about what management is. There may be some people out here in our viewing audience who don't know what the term management means when we talk about in the, in the dog training world. Management means uh, arranging the dog's environment so the dog is unable to practice the unwanted behavior, whether that's resource guarding or counter surfing. Oh, yes, uh, Kaylee is a, a bit of a counter surfer. She's a very inquisitive girl. But arranging things so that the dog doesn't practice the behavior. In this case, we managed the situation. Brad got up, picked up the bully sticks. It's like, we're not going to let you guys continue to fuss over and trade and possibly get into a scuffle over the two bully sticks. You no, know, another form of way we might have managed that would be put a dog on either side of the baby gate, separating uh, Lisa's office here from our living room. One dog could be in here with the bully stick and another in the other room. Um, both dogs are really social. They want to be where we are. So that wouldn't have worked in that situation. But for many, it is. I mean, with dinner time, uh, meal time, we separate our dogs. They're probably, their bowls are probably 15 or 20 feet apart. Uh, some people may choose actually to feed one dog in a completely separate room with the door closed. You know, it does two things. It prevents the unwanted behavior from happening, the guarding. And it takes the stress off. Now, the dog's not in this constant state of stress trying to eat fast, saying, oh, my God, if I don't eat this, somebody's going to come steal it from me. I mean, that's not a good way to, to be. I know if I'm trying to eat and I'm stressed at the same time, I get indigestion. <laughs> so, you know, if we can manage it so that the dog can be comfortable 
with what they feel valuable, uh, all the better. Yeah, and so when we think about management and prevention, um, before puppy Kaylee came into our home, the day that we brought her home, we made sure inside the house that every single item that two dogs might possibly um, want was picked up. We picked up all chew toys, we picked up all bones, we picked up toys. We didn't want anything out that, even though Cody had never really shown any guarding um, behaviors, we, wa we wanted to prevent any potential scuffle from happening over a, a, an item that he might like not want her to have. You know, we've always heard the phrase, you know, the proverbial bone of contention. Yeah. I know where it comes from. If our dogs are each enjoying a licky mat or if they're each enjoying a Kong, pretty much as soon as one is finished, we watch really carefully and, you know, step in between if one dog, dog A moves over towards dog B. Uh, just so the other one can finish in peace, or we pick everything up at the same time. Gosh, we've had more people that we know join us. Love it. Look at all these people. Gosh, you guys. Howdy. Mary Mary Devaney Conyers down in Dallas. Shelly, hey. Melinda, howdy. California. Melissa, Tiffany, Dawn. Hey. Guys, thank you. So, so reminder, um, reminder. I'm going to say this throughout. Aggressive displays, whether it's aggressive display over something your dog is guarding, uh, or not, aggressive displays are natural, normal behaviors in dogs and in people. They're intended to increase distance between a perceived threat. And in this case, the threat is something being taken away by someone or another dog. So they, I think we put really high expectations on our dogs to think that they should never growl, snipe, snark, bite, or growl. Um, I can, I'm never going to go through my whole life without being angry at some point in time and raising my voice and lashing out at someone. Yeah, if somebody takes the last french fry off my plate, like, I'm going to get upset. We've been married a very <laughs> long time, and we share food quite well. And I like to nibble on Brad's food, like if he's got something on his plate. And I'm going to ask him, do you mind if I have a bite of that? I'm not just going to run in and grab something off his plate. She learned that the hard way. <laughs> and so do not, do not, do not ever feel like you have the right to reach in your dog's food bowl and grab any food for the heck of showing that you can do it. Not, totally not cool. It's just rude. It's rude, yeah. So, it's like it would be rude if I grabbed food off of this plate or somebody else's plate. Dang, I was gonna say something now and just I'm completely sorry. left my mind. It's okay. Um, but how can we, you know, we've talked about a little bit about management already as far as maybe feeding your dogs in a different room or a baby gate between you know, where each dog is enjoying something. Oh, I know what it was. I'll, come, I'll just jump there now. We'll go back to back, we'll, we'll talk about prevention throughout, so don't You know, worry. back when I was a kid, everybody said, you know, if the dog's eating, just stay away. Or if the dog's got a bone, don't go near him. It would just seem like then it was common sense. Oh, the dog's got a bone. I'm, I'm not going to go over there. And now it's sort of like, well, we should be able to go do anything. I think Lisa was sort of getting in that direction. But I think we just need to respect their space a little bit. Um, Absolutely. And, and they show us, dogs will give us information by their body signals. They have, you know, thousands of years of, of ability, or genetic um, upbringing, if you will, designed to resolve conflict. So those behaviors are in the resource guarding realm, freezing. So if I was approaching a dog who was a little bit uncomfortable, um, thinking that I might want to take something away from them, they might freeze. So that, at that pause in uh, movement after having been chewing on something, Speedy consumption, they'll eat faster. Or they may just pick it up and walk away with it. Mm -hmm. They could growl. Growl, you never pun do not oh, punish yes. a growl. Um, a growl is a good thing. It's, it's information that tells you that your dog is uncomfortable with whatever is going on at the moment. Um, snarl, snap, and it, an and inhibited bite. So no damage is done. It's like, hey, buddy, you know, get away. Um, but again, back to the growl, you know, a lot of people, or should I say there are folks who don't understand that a growl is a good thing. Um, you know, they may be walking towards the dog with a bone, they growl, and the person yells at the dog for growling at them. And, yeah, you may teach the dog not to growl. And that's possible. But now you have no warning signal. So instead of being able to growl, the dog just waits there being more and more un uncomfortable, not being able to express that 
discomfort until you get too close and then they go on to that, that bite that Lisa mentioned. So if the dog growls, just say, thank you, that's good information. I've got something to work on here. Um, you just triggered a thought that's totally gone. See, it happens to the best of I know, I know. <laughs> hey, Nancy Kearns just joined us. Uh, hey, Nancy, thanks for being here. And Sandy, look at all you fun people that we know. I love this. Thank you for, for joining us. So relative to the um, level, if you will, of signals that your dog shows, whether it's just a slight freeze or um, if it's an inhibited bite toward you or another dog because they don't want that you or the other dog to get their prized possession, that behavior can be modified. Don't let anybody tell you that force, fear, and uh, in or intimidation is what you should use. Absolutely do not. You can uh, help modify that behavior through the use of classical conditioning and operant conditioning. So we want to change the dog's association with me being near the food bowl or with another dog being near the food bowl. I will tell you if it's dog-dog, um, a dog-dog situation, it's easier to just manage the situation. Feed your dog in other rooms, let them enjoy their high-value chew toys in other rooms or behind baby gates, um, and then you don't have to go through training or behavior modification. If it's dog people, uh, resource guarding, I think uh, management certainly needs to take place, but also some modification, especially if there are children in the house or if children visit the house regularly. Um, kids sometimes don't have the same amount of control <laughs> that an adult might. And, and they're just, walking around. If they're little kids, they're walking around with, with food, food on them or they smell like food. So you so, really want to be cautious. So in that case, we definitely home. want to start working on modifying that behavior. And this, you know, if we can prevent it in the first place, all the better. So there are a number of ways. I know a lot of our trainer friends, many on this list here, I think they're watching now, have gotten new puppies recently. And uh, like I said, Kaylee is seven months old now, so we went through a bunch of this with her. But helping her learn that us approaching her when she's got something valuable is going to be awesome that more good stuff is gonna happen so that she doesn't feel always threatened uh, if we come near her while she's chewing on the bully stick or a bone or whatever. So I started out teaching her uh, a, a formal game called what we call the trade game. We do have a video on our YouTube channel of uh, teach your dog to trade. Um, but also very opportunistically throughout the day, um, she's a puppy, she's gonna get something in her mouth that she shouldn't have. So I just traded her. I traded her whatever she had in her mouth that I didn't want her to have for a tasty morsel. I always have some form of food in my pockets. So um, I would just trade her the piece of paper or the pen that I dropped um, for um, a yummy piece of food. Yeah, there's probably not one load of laundry comes out of our washing machine that some amount of dog food doesn't come out with it. But. You talk about association. Um, Kaylee goes, and Willow did this too, um, when I go to take clothes out of the dryer, the dog is there because, because they know there gets some <laughs> freshly laundered treat is going to drop on the floor when we pull the clothes out. So, so again, you know, at dinner time is a great time to work on it. You can, you know, after you put their food bowl down, walk past it and just drop a couple of pieces of chicken in on top of their food. That hey, wait, every time he comes near me when I'm eating, something even better shows up. I call that the food bowl lottery. So you now they start to learn that eh, it's not a big deal if a person comes near me while I've got something. They valuable. actually want you. They'll actually like, oh, can you come near me? Again? I'd like another piece of steak, please. So that's you know, certainly one way to do it, starting as a puppy, playing the trade game, as Lisa just mentioned. Those puppies are going to constantly be picking stuff up. And I had one client say one time, well, won't that just train my puppy to go find something and and you know, steal it so that it'll get a piece of food. I'm thinking that might happen. Hey, you're on your way to a formal retreat. Absolutely. So, you know, there are bigger problems to have than your puppy bringing you the random sock that you left on the floor. Yeah, I think that um, uh, Bob and Susan Ryder were talking, uh, fabulous dog trainers up in uh, Bloomington, Illinois, were talking about their dog Daisy, who will bring them a sock. Yeah, you know, bringing you a sock. Hey, want to give me something here? So, you know, like I said, that's the. That's, uh, not nearly as bad a problem as the dog deciding to you know, guard that sock against the, any and all comers. 
I think it's also wise. Um, our dogs like, you know, stinky, smelly, garbage kind of things. So when you're out on walks, um, here we're out in our pasture, there's deer poop, there's, you know, all sorts of stinky things that the dogs can roll in or want to eat. Um, again, I'm always carrying food in my pocket. So if they pick up something I don't want them to have, I can trade them for it. We've also taught them a lovely leave it. So if we say leave it, they've learned to move away from whatever, whatever it is they're about to get their mouth on and that prevents them from picking it up in the first place. But if they do, then again, it might be handy, dandy, tasty morsels to trade them for. And you know, it's, it's interesting what dogs choose to guard and why. I don't know that we'll always understand the why. We had a client who's inside the house. It didn't have toys. The dog was fine sharing toys. Um, it's food, uh, chew bones, bully sticks. No problem with a person coming near them at all. But outside the house, the dog could pick up a random stick or a rock. And all of a sudden, that became the most valuable thing in the world. So it's, it's you know, some dogs don't care about their, their food bowl, but will you know, guard a tennis ball with their life and vice versa. And think, remember um, our cats, Zena, um, oh, bless yeah. her heart, she's passed on now. And Grayson. And Grayson. But yeah, it was the two of them. So Zena would guard her food bowl. So if we fed the cats, um, we fed the cats relatively close, but with space between them. But if anybody got near Zena's food bowl, she would growl. She'd kick butt and take yeah. names. Um, and the other cat would just, ah, no problem. I'm just going to move away from this. However, um, Grayson, on the other hand, if, if Zena happened to be lying behind the wood stove in the nice warm toasty spot, Grayson would come up and say, this is going to be my place. Would you move away, please? So again, it was relative. In one situation, Zena was going to have it her way. And in, in a different situation, you know, Grayson was going to have it his way. So, so they each guarded different things at different times. And the other ones read that, that, that their body signals well, and they resolved the conflict without having to come to fisticuffs. Right. Um, so that's the outcome we want. You know, for the, if the dog feels you know, that this is mine, to, in a very polite way to say, excuse me, I'm enjoying this. Hopefully the other dog has the social skills to read that and move on. But if not, how are we gonna work with that? If not, you wanna find um, someone who has some solid, fear-free, force-free, um, professional, behavior consultant or certified um, behavior trainer, yeah. veterinary behaviorist, yeah. thank you, I lost my word, veterinary behaviorist to help you with, to modify the behavior. The prognosis of modifying the behavior uh, depends on several different things really. First of all, the number of stressors or you might say triggers that trigger the dog to guarding. Is it just one thing that the dog guards or is it many, many things? And can you clearly identify what those things are? And of course, managing it and manage it in the meantime. Owner compliance, commitment That's and big. compliance. If you don't have a, com if you're not committed yourself to helping your dog overcome the behavior, and you're not willing to change your own behavior to help your dog, then change theirs. Then um, that can be problematic. And I love what Pat Miller said in her book, "Be Worth the Dog." Two great books. Um, we'll talk about these in a minute. And that is, you no, know, you can really, really help you know, your dog through some of this resource guarding behavior. But she says she likes to refer to it as a, a recovering resource guarder. Not fixed, not cured, but recovering. Um, never knows, at least some of those triggers are going to stack up again. And that resource guarding behavior you know, crops back up. So as we mentioned, classical conditioning. One thing predicting something else, two things paired together to change the association or counter conditioning to change the association. Um, in this case, with a dog, maybe the guards its food bowl. If the person or other dog entered the room, more chicken range from the sky. The other dog goes away, boom, back to normal dry kibble. So pretty soon the dog has the guarding behavior. And I'm paraphrasing this down a little bitty piece starts to realize that, oh, every time the other dog comes near, I get better stuff. And that is a, you know, with counter conditioning, as Lisa always said, if you think you're going slow, you need to slow down a little bit more. 
it is a slow process because we are trying to change an emotional response. Um, but it's probably one of the most surefire, most often go-to methods for helping a dog change that. Right. And both both Pat Miller in her dog, the, uh, in her dog, in her book, Beware of the Dog, uh, Positive Solutions for Aggressive Behavior in Dogs, um, has some great information on aggressive displays in general, but certainly resource guarding. And then Jean Donaldson's book, Mine, is a go-to for resource guarding. And I would also say that you, if you're not already subscribing to Whole Dog Journal, as soon as you finish watching this, go to wholedogjournal.com, click and order a subscription. Really good, solid information every month on uh, things that will help you and your dog. You know, I just realized looking at this list of people who have joined and are paying attention, um, we're preaching to the choir to a lot of these. We so. are, yeah. You guys know this stuff. Um, so, yeah, again, share this with your clients. If, if you, you happen would. to be watching this after the fact and you, you know, need more information, chances are a lot of these other people uh, here, if they're in your area, can, can be of assistance. So, uh, continuing with prognosis, I talked about number of gun stressors, um, clear identification of those, um, owner compliance and commitment, of course, bite threshold. You know, it was. Did the dog bite? Did the dog bite and do damage? That makes a difference, of course. Does the dog give a warning or not give a warning? I've worked with dogs who seemingly, um, you really are unable to see all those early freezing, speed of consumption, growl, and there, there's lack of impulse and they go straight to a bite. Um, so all of that, the prognosis kind of depends on, on some of that. And then other variables, the size of the dog. You know, is it a toy dog? Is it a 125-pound Great Dane? Um, so I would say um, always, you know, veterinary behaviorist, uh, behavior consultant who has experience with fear-free and force-free techniques. Again, don't let anybody ever tell you you need to use force, fear, or intimidation to change your dog's behavior. You no, know, uh, again, depending on the dog, as Lisa said, uh, certainly a, a big dog is, has the potential to do more damage than a small dog, but in either case, or in both cases, it's the dog that's unstressed, that is in stress, uh, distress, is easy. anyway, yeah. they're stressed. So we want, not to, feeling happy about we want to eliminate that stress so they don't feel that they need to have this big display to protect their stuff. Uh, again, as I mentioned, if you can start with puppies and build it from there, that is super. Sometimes we get dogs as adults, and these behaviors can be brought on, or they can. This resource guarding behavior can occur later in life, as it has done sort of here with our guy Cody a little bit. Uh, he never guarded stuff really before from either of our other dogs that he's lived with, um, but with Kaylee, uh, he's a little older. He's a little grumpier, and he's he's in, in some pain now. We so, manage his pain with, with a, a pain specialist. You know, I've seen more lip curls from him in the last few months than we I have in his whole life, really. Many, many yeah. years. So it can, you know, just because your dog is perfect now doesn't mean that these issues can't crop up down the road. We talk, let's talk about that a little bit um, relative to what in the dog training world is called trigger stacking. In the human world, um, let me give you an example of trigger stacking. Good Lord, it happened to me. Um, a week or two ago, and this was not the scenario, but uh, we don't live in a city. But if you live in a city, um, think about you get up to go to work and you're late. Um, and so you're a little stressed because you're late. And then on your way out the door because you're rushing, you spill coffee on your clothes. And that frustrates you. You get in the car um, and you back out of your driveway and head out on the street and somebody cuts you off in traffic. And then that frustrates the heck out of you. So you get to work and then something happens with your boss and your boss is, happens to your work and your boss gets frustrated with it and he or she isn't happy. You get through the day, you're grumbling, you get home and your spouse says, I thought you were gonna stop at the store to pick up some quinoa or some kale. Don't let this happen to you. And <laughs> <laughs> and your spouse goes, or you go, nah! 
And so you've just had multiple stresses throughout your day and you've just tipped over, you know, you've tipped over your stress threshold. So it happens with our dogs too. So if, if your dog has, you know, maybe he in the morning got snarked at by another dog when he was out for his morning walk. And then that afternoon he went to training class, which was fun, but yet still training, learning is hard. It can be a little stressful. And then maybe there's a thunderstorm and your dog doesn't particularly like that. And then the new puppy comes over by his food bowl. So he might be able to deal with the puppy coming near the food bowl on any other day. But in the day where he's had all of these other stressors in his life, that could be the one tipping point. So being aware of all of this also, you, know, you may not guard those that food bowl on normal days, like I said, but on a stressful day, it could tip over for sure so gosh we've already been here for 30 minutes so um we scheduled this scheduled this for 30 minutes so thanks you but guys for joining us if you've got any questions we'll be happy to answer those or if you are typing them in we're not seeing them we're seeing yeah, everybody we're name. seeing everybody's name but we're not seeing any questions so if, so if they if they're there we don't see them yeah, um, and we'll try to answer any that come in afterwards but um let us know uh, if you, you know what else you'd like to hear about in our in our first and only until today Facebook live uh, we had someone I think it was Kimberly Kaufman who said can you talk about resource guarding a little bit um, so that's why we're here so let us know what you might like to hear someone has mentioned dog dog introductions oh my gosh we have ex recent experience of that with Cody and Kaylee and as many of you know that did not go well for a few months um, and thankfully they're you know good buds now and even though we have to manage their resources a little bit, it's like on a scale of one to 100, it's like it's one. not too bad. Yeah, it's nothing. So let us know what you'd like to hear about. We like doing these. It's fun. Um, and gosh, thanks for joining us. Wherever you are, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your afternoon and or evening. Absolutely. See you next time. See ya. Bye.